Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights in Entertainment. This is episode 63, Unanswered Questions. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my brilliant and entertaining co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, dear? So far, so good. And you? I'm doing all right. So today... As the title suggests, we have a number of questions that we'll be exploring, which I'm not sure we necessarily have the answers to. Don't think we do. Um, There's the big question of whether Disney World or Disneyland will open in 2020 again. Uh, Then Abigail Disney, um, Disney heiress, granddaughter of Roy Disney, right? Yeah, she's not Walt's uh, Walt's great grand niece i guess i think or right. grand niece uh she had her own question which we'll talk about in somewhat less graphic terms <laughs> than she did um and then somehow even though we're shut down there's still a lawsuit so there's always a good lawsuit against disney somewhere always uh in our star wars insights we'll talk about a new uh show that disney plus is working on mm-hmm. for star wars uh, we'll also talk on rumors, or accounts, I guess we could say, of season three of The Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. And then in our entertainment news, we have some additional virtual experiences mm-hmm. coming out of Wizard World. Then a uh, little known fact about Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which I was kind of shocked when I heard about it. Mm-hmm. And then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Okay. Are we ready to get started? Sure. All right. Go for Disney Detective. So, out of the financial world, I guess you can say, um, you know, it's, you know, there are uh, some articles coming out, you know, wondering if, you know, Disney World and Disneyland will even open um, before the end of, of this year. Uh, you know, so Disney initially closed all of its domestic resorts through the end of March at first. Um, and then now, you know, they, they're basically closed indefinitely. There's no timeline for return to operations. Um, you know, theme park enthusiasts have chimed in with their opinions and, you know, hoping, being hopeful, you know, in what they're thinking is. Um, but some Wall Street pros have also weighed in on the matter. And some analysts say that Walt Disney World, um, you know, probably, you know, might not open at all for, you know, the end of the summer, um, you know, and that California might not even open until January of next year. Um, so obviously, you know, they were bracing for this. They had the furlough, you know, of, you know, 100,000 workers um, and that, you know, it's basically going to save the entertainment company $500 million a month. But, you know, when, you know, will they, you know, start bringing people back? That's really, you know, nothing is certain at this point, Um, you know, and that when you think about a Disney experience, it's not social distancing at all. You know, everything is, you know, pushing you into a room, making sure there's no, you know, space in front of you, you know, getting close to everybody, you know, even the restaurants, we were even talking about it, you know, during the week, what's dining going to be like, um, you know, so many of their restaurants are, are buffets, um, you know, is that even going to be something that they're going to be doing? You know, so there's so much that that still has to be done 
to get things ready for the park to even open to be able to make sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, even from a logistics <coughs> standpoint, right. we've had several stories on the show in the past few weeks mm -hmm. about Disney basically donating all their food and their supplies right. and, and all this stuff to help in this situation. Right. So you're looking at probably six to eight weeks to restock all the food and mm -hmm. everything else, assuming you can. Right. I mean, even at this in point that, in time, there's shortages in manufacturing right, and everything. Right, there's so many different, you know, company, you know, food producing companies that are, are shut down because yeah. of this or not producing as much. So, you know, is it something that it would take them a couple of months just to even yeah. ramp up? And I also have to think, well, first of all, you have, you've laid off 100,000 employees. Mm -hmm. Are all those employees sitting at home waiting for a call back or have they gone on to find other employment? Right. That's the other thing, too. You know, have they they moved on to, to something else? You know, what else is even, you know, available within that right. those locations? You know, it's such a tourist driven you know but there's uh, you economic know economic area there's other like you see the commercials for domino's pizza oh, for domino's instance pizza, everyone's trying everyone who's stores, still open right. is trying to recruit to people. people and get right. people in cuz they need the body so that's one thing right the other thing to consider is i have to wonder what disney is doing to in change the way that it handles its cues right. and its lines and everything else. Right. There were you know, are they still gonna jam thousands of people into a queue for Peter Pan or are they gonna go to a vir virtual queue like they did for Star Wars? Right. And that was one of the things there there have been various different things popping up, you know, in in different sites talking about, you know, uh, uh, utilizing the online check-in more for the hotel so that you don't actually have to, right. you know, talk to somebody at the front desk or, you know, doing lots of things on your own phone, having, you know, the capability to do that or, or call somebody. And then the other thing was talking about the virtual queue because they figured out how to make it work for Rise of the Resistance, right. are you going to have more rides that are like that, you know, and maybe benches and areas and, set know, up, to, spread out, so that if you're sitting and waiting, you're not right on top of somebody. To Disney's credit, they're smart. And mm -hmm. I could certainly see them using this downtime to figure out how they're going to re-engineer their, their experience oh, to I'm make it and safer I'm sure moving forward. I'm sure that's what they're, they're doing. I think, you know, a lot of the pre-show areas are going to be done with. You know, I don't think, you know, I, I could definitely see them, you know, when you're going through like a queue line, you know having somebody there to space you out right. you know like almost like um the the highways that have the on ramps right, that right. actually regulate the traffic going going on i could totally see them doing something like that using your magic band and it letting you know when it's time to go so that there's a flow yeah. and that you're not actually standing or if you do have to stand Make sure, you and know, like the problem, there's markers or something. You know, you're facing two problems here. You're facing the obvious need for social distancing. Mm -hmm. But even when that time has passed, you're going to be facing paranoia and fear of people who Absolutely. aren't going to want to be on top of each mm -hmm. other. And those people are not going to go to a Disney right. park out of fear unless mm -hmm. there's something to alleviate that fear. And Disney, right. ha you know... I, I joke all the time about taking your shoes off at the airport. It does mm -hmm. absolutely nothing for security, but it makes people feel, feel like you're safer. doing something. Right, right. So Disney has to do something to alleviate the legitimate fears that people have well, of being in an environment like that. And they, you know, there were a couple of different articles talking about that they'll take your temperature. You know, when you go through right. security, right? As you can, like, have your bag check will have a non-touch temperature. You know, to and there are there are places now, like uh, I think it was Hong Kong or, or one of the uh, major Asian cities, mm -hmm. they're using thermal cameras right. now, and that's to look what they were saying is is doing that where you you don't you know you just walk through because some of the security systems were even just but you know. Let's be honest; that really is as useless as taking your shoes off yeah. at the airport because. So many people with COVID are mm -hmm. non-symptomatic. Well, and that's the thing is there are so many, you know, younger people that, 
you know, d until the day before they don't exhibit any, you know, symptoms. They're not running fevers. They're not, you know, or right. they're a carrier. And it, it so it, it's, you know, I definitely see you have the people that are going to stay away. You know, you have the people that are, you know, going to, you know, if they need to do a vacation, they're going to find some way to do a secluded well, you know, and that's the problem with Disney is everything about a Disney park vacation mm -hmm. plays into the negative aspect right. of this disease. Right. You know, you have queues, you have buffets, you have lines. At, like Disney is one big giant line of people. Oh, yeah. Or a bus. If you, you know, take the yeah. bus from, from a resort or any of the transportation, it's, you know, how many people can you pack on? Right. Plus, you know, get all the standing people. Like, what are you going to do now? You know, for each bus, you only let 20 people on. Disney, you know, how many more buses are you going to have to run? Disney has you know? proven themselves masters of handling mass amounts of people. Mm -hmm. And they do it in, in large blocks. Oh, yeah. Of chunks yeah. of people mm -hmm. and that's exactly the wrong <clears throat> environment that right. you want to be in with this stuff and right and you're looking <clears throat> at probably several years you know you're going to we need a vaccine to come out before mm -hmm. anyone starts to feel comfortable about any of this mm -hmm. yeah and then even then you're probably not going to see face masks go away for quite some time oh, no. and that's the thing is uh, i could definitely see you know you checking into the resort did you bring your own face mask no, here, right. go to the gift shop. We have various different Disney themed. Yeah, we're going to be wearing ones. face f fashionable face masks like men wear fashionable ties. You uh, know? I, I definitely see it. I already, you know, could, could you know, going back to, to work if and when, you know, I actually have to go back into the office, I'm sure a whole lot of us are still going to be wearing face masks for. Yep. The foreseeable future. Yeah. So, with regard to this, if Disney is not going to be closed, uh, opening until after the first of the year, I hope they're smart about staying closed right. and figuring out a way to provide that protection and that sense of protection mm -hmm. more than anything else. Yeah, yeah. Um, to just close and furlough people for the sake of saving money is one thing, but right. to do it smartly so that when people are ready to go mm -hmm. back. They need to be safe and they need right. to feel safe. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they will. I'm sure, you know, and because they did it with after 9-11. Right. You know, exactly. that was when, you know, you always knew they had security around and it wasn't until after 9-11 that security got so much. Although, ironically, not a single thing for security would have prevented what happened on 9-11. Absolutely. Bag checks did not, it's not going to stop someone from crashing oh, a plane in the mass of people. Absolutely. But, you know, how many people have, you know, tried to bring weapons and guns into Disney and. A, a startling number, actually. Yeah, which totally boggles the mind. But, you know, they did, you know, stop various things from that. So, again, right. you know, that was a quick thing to kind of fix, you know. Right. And again, it's that. Take your shoes off at the airport. Make make right. people think that you're doing security. Yeah, so we'll good. we'll see. But you know, I, I as time goes on, and you know, you're not seeing. We're not seeing much end in sight, even though we're getting closer. You know, we're closer than we were before. I guess. Yeah. You know, for for something like this, you know, and other entertainment venues where there's large crowds of, of people you know it, it'll be interesting to see you know when and and how it'll be different because it'll always be different you yes know, yes going it will. forward so so speaking of furloughs let's <laughs> give us abigail disney's opinion on the furloughs. oh abigail 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 she's she's definitely um a character she's her own <laughs> uh, interesting uh, heiress, I guess. So uh, she made uh, some comments uh, this past Tuesday um, on Twitter, uh, basically uh, talking about the furloughs of the the hundreds of you know thousands of low paying workers uh, after Disney executives paid out millions of dollars to their executives. So she was quoted as saying, "What the actual f." 
dot dot dot. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so it was on on Tuesday, like I had said, uh, that she basically sam- slammed Disney's decision to furlough theme park workers after the company paid dividends to shareholders and gave executives big bonuses. Uh, Disney hadn't revealed any plans uh, for 2020 dividends. Um, but we, as we had talked about, the top executives took a pay cut because of everything going on with, with COVID-19. Um, so it actually, you know, as we've been talking, they announced earlier this month that they were furloughing uh, employees whose jobs weren't necessary at the time. And, you know, a big chunk of those employees are, are the seasonal, you know, theme park uh, workers, resort workers, and also entertainment uh, production workers. Um, so more than 75% of the company's 223,000 employees work for the parks and production uh, products division. So Abigail has obviously been a fierce critic, uh, being very outspoken about the way Disney's been handling things, you know, for the past couple of months, it seems right. we've heard more about her. Uh, she previously called your best friend, uh, Bob Iger, salary insane. Um, which it was. Which it was, uh, saying, you know, that last year he made four, uh, $47 million, uh, which is 911 times the median worker's pay. Well, let's be accurate. Forty-seven million five hundred twenty-five thousand five hundred and sixty dollars. Sorry, I was rounding. Even if you knock off <laughs> the, the five, forty-seven million, yeah, the five hundred and twenty-five. That, that's probably what he should that, be making. Oh, the five hundred twenty-five thousand. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so she had basically tweeted, you know, what kind of person is comfortable with this? Asking um, for Bob number two and Bob number one to reconsider their pay and return some of that money, obviously. Back to the company. Um, she said, Disney faces a rough couple of years, to be sure, but that doesn't constitute permission to continue uh, pillaging and rampaging by management. She has a point there. She, you, know. you know, she does. And but, I'm, I'm kind of mixed on her. Right. The other part is, how much money does she have? How right. much money is she right. making from this? You know? So a couple of points to make on this. One is... I'm not upset about Disney furloughing its park employees right. because they can't work. It's right. one thing if you're an office person who can do your job remotely and you can still work and there's a need for you to work. Right. The parks are closed. There's right. no need for these people to work. A haunted mansion ride attendant is not needed. There's Correct. There's nothing for now, them to do. Conversely, Disney has more money than God. So if anyone can afford to pay their employees to sit mm-hmm. at home, Disney can. Right. I could understand business-wise them not doing that. Right. The second thing is, so so there's a business justification mm-hmm. for it. The second thing is the Disney executives have taken a pay cut. Right. A huge one. Iger's yeah. not even taking a salary at right. this point and in time. And Bob number two, Chepik, he's a 50% pay cut right. at this and, point. And as much as people may not want to admit it, your executive management is required to keep the company running. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not the guys that are down there letting people on the rides. They're actually keeping the company running and figuring out how the hell they're going right. to get out of this situation. Right. They're probably in meetings every day nonstop right. trying to figure out, okay, where are we with this project? Where are we with this? What are what are we doing to make things safer so we can open Exactly. Back so up. they have a justifiable right. need mm-hmm. for continuing to work, and mm-hmm. they're doing it at a significantly reduced compensation. Right. Now, looking at it from the other side... Their compensation, if you're getting compensated $47 million a year like Iger was, totally re- outrageous. Mm-hmm. The most these guys should be making is a million dollars a year. Mm-hmm. No need to make any more than that. All right. I'm sure your house is already paid off. Right. I'm sure, you know, if so, you make that much money, you so know. So let's, for instance, let's say it was Iger. Mm-hmm. So Iger was making... We'll round it up to fifty million. Okay. What's three million among friends? Well, right? and we know that you know there were bonuses attached right. and various things. So too, he's going to so take far. half a salary at twenty five million. That's still like completely ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Now, fortunately, Iger decided not to take a salary. Right. But his positions changed, so we don't know what his salary would have been anyway. Right. Right. But when you're making that kind of money and you graciously decide to take half of that, you're still stealing. You know. 500 times more than mm-hmm. you should be stealing in the first place. Right, right. So I understand her point there. Mm-hmm. 
And lastly, to your point, how much money does she have? Right. How much is she, what, what is she doing with that money to help these people? Is she donating the charity? Did she set up a trust fund? Right. What did she do other than to come out and, and make inflammatory remarks on Twitter to try and grab some press? Mm-hmm. You know, what What else is she doing at this point in time? Because I'm I'm guessing she's probably got a few dollars stashed away considering her right. family heritage. Yeah, basically, you know, the, the article says that, you know, she doesn't have a role within the company. She's previously blasted worker, you know, working conditions at Disneyland and how much they were paying back when they were still open. Right. Um, she said, I'm just a citizen who cares, and I think that makes me free to say what I believe. But she, she's but, not, though, is the but problem. But I'm an heir... And I do carry this name with me everywhere, and I have the conscious. I have a conscious which makes it very difficult for me to sit by and see abuses taking place in the name attached to them. So then you take a chunk right. of your wealth, you exactly. set up a trust fund, and you set up a system so that these employees who are furloughed right. can now tap onto that trust fund, mm -hmm. you know, and and somehow be compensated for. Right, it. and then you come out of you know. Disney heiress. Right. You know. You come out as the one smelling like roses, saving the day for all these employees. Right. Instead of just pointing fingers, exactly. which is what she's doing. Exactly. So. And all this is, is a, it's a it's a publicity grab is mm -hmm. all it is. Yep. Because, you know, what can she hope to, what's she trying to do? Like, shame Disney into doing something at this point in time? Right. You know, actions speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. And if Disney's not making any money, then she's not getting any money. Because I'm sure exactly. she's on something where, you know, she gets... Well, if nothing else, she's or... getting the dividends that she's complaining about. Right, right. Because so. I'm sure she has stock and right. everything, so... So, anyway, uh, <laughs> moving right along, more good news for Disney. Disney's, more good news. Disney's got a lawsuit heading its way. Yeah, Let's talk so about that. obviously... Disney's shut down, um, but Disney World is being sued after a guest uh, got injured during an experience on Epcot's Frozen Ever After ride. So 27-year-old Amanda Peters visited Epcot on January 12th with her family. Now here's the, the part about it where, you know, I have issues, but we'll discuss. So Peter suffers from spinal bifida, spina bifida, and ha had undergone brain surgery six weeks before her trip. Her doctors had given her an okay to travel, but recommended that she limit herself to, attract, to attractions that were slow moving. So according to the lawsuit, which was obtained by the Orlando Sentinel, uh, cast members working on the attraction told Peters that the ride only had a small dip which the law, uh, the claim suits did not inform the family properly. Uh, they were unprepared for what the lawsuit calls a violent backlash when the ride vehicle drops while moving backwards near the end of the attraction. Peters claims that she hit her head on a seat and it rattled her brain. Uh, when she got off the ride, her speech was reportedly slurred and the family needed to schedule an MRI. So... You just had brain surgery six weeks ago, and you decide to go to Disney. Okay, I, I, I get that. Why would you go on any ride at that point? You know, every ride has a warning sign yep. before you go on them. If you have neck injuries, if you have yep. back problems, if you're pregnant, you know, granted... She, they asked a cast member, and the cast member was like, "Oh no, it only has a small dip." And if you read, you know, the description, the official description of Frozen Ever After includes that the ride has small drops. That's all it, it right. you know. But maybe if you actually say to the cast member, "Hey, listen, I just had surgery." You know, so I think you know, and again, we don't know well, the full details of everything. I kind of, like, I feel bad for her. I'm sorry she, she had all these issues. But, well, and I think you know, this as is, long as the ride itself, as long as the ride signage has the warnings, right. that's what you rely on. You don't right. rely on the opinion right. of a cast member. Right. The cast members have their own, like, a small drop 
small is completely subjective. Right. Read the sign. If the right. sign says, if you have these conditions, it's not recommended. Right. And you still go on it, right. then you are assuming the, the responsibility. Right. And where the, you know, the, the doctor said slow moving right, I'm sure he meant, and even it's a small world, okay? It's a small world, has, has no drops, it's a slow moving boat ride. But if by the time you get to the exit, there's a backup of people waiting to get off the ride, right. Boats are going to bump you, and you if you're not prepared for it, you get a little jarred, and yep. I could totally see how you could hurt yourself. Now, if that's if not, that. if that isn't mentioned on the signage, right. then you have a case. Right, and that... And because I I'll tell you, they... I have you know herniated discs mm-hmm. in my back. I have various ailments. Mm-hmm. Let's, I don't want to go into a list of right, them, but, right. but when I go down and I go on a ride, there are certain rides that I go on that I shouldn't go on, mm-hmm. like... Star Tours. Right. Okay. But I like the ride. I like the experience. I get off of that ride and my back hurts. Right. Okay. I don't sue Disney for that. Right. Because I accept the responsibility of that mm-hmm. knowing right. that I'm getting on a ride that I shouldn't be getting on. Right. But knowing that any injury that is caused is one that I'm going to mm-hmm. take responsibility for. Right. It, it almost seems like. You know, this person, you know, didn't do her research because there's so much out there where, you know, you can go through, you know, net. Disney has even come out with virtual versions of their ride, you know, on YouTube where you can go and watch. Right. Sit and watch it. Or you talk to somebody at Guest Relations and you say, I had surgery. Well, see, and I don't <laughs> know. know. I. I can't expect the rider to go through those lens. Right. That's what the signage is for. Oh, absolutely. If the signage is there and it says you have these injuries, Mm -hmm. it's recommended not to ride it. Right. That's all you need at that point in time. You get up to the line. You see what the requirements are. Right. If it's something that's questionable, you step out of line. No one's mm-hmm. going to force you to get on the ride right. at that point in right. time. Exactly. You can step out of line and, and be done with it. Mm-hmm. And if you don't and you still get on the ride, right. it's your responsibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and I don't know if the signage is there. I don't recall. Last time we went, I don't recall what the signage was it's for. There. It. It's there for, for that. But if it is and you're still getting on the ride... And you try to sue, it's a frivolous lawsuit at that point. Right. And that and that's the thing is that, you know, if it was just, you know, because it, it talks about in this article that um, Universal actually is also being sued by a Texas man who claims that on a ride of Hagrid's Magical Motorbikes Adventure in December, uh, it left him with back problems that required surgery after the ride actually malfunctioned and stopped for a period uh, before... Um, you know, it kind of th- threw him, you know, around in the ride. That's completely different. That's different because the ride malfunctioned right. and whatnot. Here, the ride didn't malfunction. There was nothing wrong. It was that, you know, the person didn't take the time. Right. They got on know. a ride that there, that was clearly marked they shouldn't have gotten on. Right. And then they took it upon themselves to accept that responsibility mm-hmm. and get on it. Right. So at that point, you got to deal with the consequences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was it for our Disney detective. For our D- Disney bashing. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were sticking up for Disney. We for were. Most of we it, were. We were actually. Which is very unusual yeah. for me. So we'll take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll do our Star Wars insights. Mm hmm. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today 
at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Star Wars Insights. I should have known. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there is a new Star Wars series that is in the works uh, for Disney+. Plus. Not really a whole lot uh, has come out about it. Um, so basically, you know, the, the article was uh, Disney is continuing to expand the Star Wars galaxy. Um, Russian doll co-creator Leslie Headland is developing a new live-action Star Wars series for the streaming service. Uh, the article came from The Hollywood Reporter. Uh, Headland will write and act as showrunner for the project, which is said to have a female-centric point of view on a galaxy far, far away. Um, so the deal actually concluded several months ago, and Headland actually attended the Los Angeles premiere of Star Wars Rise of Skywalker uh, in December. And that's really all that uh, has come up. You know, I, I looked through a bunch of different articles uh, to try and, you know, see if there was anything more about it. And that was really all. It was really more of a teaser uh, than anything else. Um, but kind of cool that it'll be a, you know, female uh, lead, you know, uh, story. Um, and basically the article, you know, the rest of the article talked about... Um, Headland's career, um, you know, she received uh, two Emmy nominations for uh, Russian Doll, which is a Netflix uh, series, um, and then she, you know, did some other, you know, movies as well, and you know, some romantic comedies and and things like that. Um, so this is just another series that Disney Plus is, is looking to do, you know. In the Star Wars galaxy, we obviously know the other ones uh, that will be coming, and here's a, another one to to add to the the mix of things. So, uh, well, I'd love to know what time period that they're setting this mm -hmm. into, uh, because we know a couple episodes ago <clears throat> we talked about the new comics mm -hmm. uh, storylines that are coming out that right. are 600 years, I think, mm -hmm. before Phantom Menace. Right. Uh, you have the Star Wars: The Old Republic. Mm -hmm game and time period which my game uh group is from i'd love to see something come from there because mm -hmm. there's a ton of very strong female characters right. that are in that storyline yeah. um and you know there's a lot of people that are that are looking for what's coming after rise of skywalker is mm -hmm. this something that's coming in that time period yeah, it'll be nice to see you know a character we don't already know we we haven't yeah, seen before absolutely. You well know, that was kind of us... like the refreshing aspect of the mandalorian right all people that we don't um, know and a time period that's kind of sandwiched in mm -hmm. between a couple of ones that we've seen so far so i'm curious that's why not so much the characters but the time period i think is what what crabs my curiosity more than anything right when are they doing this what are we going to explore based on that let's see what kind of characters mm -hmm. that we're going to get yeah so yeah very exciting it's always so. nice to see more stuff but the other aspect of that is how is this going to affect the movies moving right. forward? We, uh, Disney seems very uh, focused on the streaming aspect mm -hmm. of telling Star Wars stories now. Right. Uh, and, you know, granted, after the stinkers that they've put out in the movie theater in the last couple of Star Wars right. movies, I can't blame them. Right. Um, but Star Wars has always been a big theater experience. Mm -hmm. And I think not having that prospect of the next one coming out, right? I, I think is is going to weigh on the franchise. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully this adds to the Star Wars universe and doesn't push those movies out too much, too much further. And and maybe you know, like like you said, they they're having more success with doing stuff on streaming and and maybe you know you kind of back away from doing a movie every two years you know let let's develop some of these you know background stories and maybe from there find a movie storyline yeah. you know and to, star wars was you know when it was actively in production it was traditionally a, a three-year cycle mm -hmm. for for each movie when you were going through the trilogy so maybe right. going back to that with this satisfying that 
that hunger, that need for more Star Wars right. might be the right formula. Yeah. Certainly their streaming aspects have been very successful. Yeah, so, so far so good. So kudos to Disney it, on that. Keep it going, yeah. Uh, so some other news that came out was that their Disney Plus is working on Mandalorian Season 3 already. Um, so uh, it was uh, mentioned that pre-production work has actually started. Um, John Favreau uh, said that he's been working on scripts uh, for a while, um, and the art department has already been working on concepts for the past few weeks. Um, the production uh, design began prep on uh, April 20th, so just, you know, this past week um so obviously mandalorian season two is expected in october and we know rosario dawson will be uh part of the the new uh cast um and that the behind the scenes series which we had talked about uh the documentary of the making of season one will be uh airing on disney plus on star wars day may 4th so kind of uh cool uh mandalorian news to all very exciting stuff mm -hmm. we, we love season one yep uh the fact that we know season two is done and they're working on season now i have to assume what they're doing in season three is what they can do right under the current working conditions well and that's the thing is writing it and you know enough of the the stuff that can be done you know from home exactly um, you know exactly. obviously they're not shooting anything um but it, you know it's a relief to know not even having seen season two yet that it's, it's been renewed for a season three so disney is clearly investing in this uh uh aspect of star wars uh, pretty heavily at this point in time with storylines, with characters, with all the various talent associated with it. Um, so very glad to see that and uh, look forward to seeing what answers we get out of season two. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ho hopefully the uh, documentary will give us some additional information. Yeah, absolutely. And that was it for our Star Wars Insider. Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll be right back with our entertainment news mm -hmm. of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. So for our entertainment news, we start off with Wizard World news. Tell us about Wizard World. Yeah, so there were a couple of emails that, that came out, um, and we've been talking about this uh, for a little while, that they're doing a lot of these virtual experiences because, obviously, you can't go to any of these conventions. Um, so each week, it seems, uh, or a couple times during the week, they're each day they're going to be doing uh, different uh, Q&As with various different cast members uh, from various different shows. Um, the Q&As are all free to attend uh, through um, Wizard World. Uh, basically, uh, some of them are done through uh, Facebook uh, Live or through Twitch. Uh, there's usually various links that, that pop up for it. Um, so on Thursday, April 3rd, they're going to be doing uh, the cast of Grimm. So various different cast members uh, from the show will be on for that. On Saturday, May 2nd, they're going to be doing Gotham, a bunch of cast members from that. And then also on uh, May 2nd, later in the day, uh, The Boys, which I wasn't familiar with, and a bunch of different uh, cast 
members from that. Um, so you can actually submit your questions and you know there there's a host that that shows up and he you know kind of moderates the the whole thing um and sends um you know questions to the the different cast members um while you're you're watching then the other thing that you can do is if you're interested you can uh sign up to do exclusive two minute live chats with uh each cast member if you're interested uh or purchase a recorded video from the star or even get an autographed uh eight by ten um so i did actually click on on the link so some of them so uh so for uh grim it's roughly like 65 dollars to you know have an experience with okay. one of the cast members uh for um gotham it was about 60 dollars, so it runs between 60 and 65 dollars which is comparable you know it's a discounted right. rate from what your show package usually right. would be and, and the other thing too is if you figure if you went to wizards you'd be um you'd be shelling out admission plus right. the fee to actually right. get into exactly the so here you know you are kind of saving money and if it's your thing you know there are people that that you know wait in line you know for hours that you know here's an experience to actually meet you right. know uh somebody you know if you're a fan of well and i have to imagine the online interactive experience that you get with them is probably going to be a little bit more personalized given mm -hmm. the circumstances oh absolutely than yeah. had you been sitting in a line and, mm -hmm. and you know getting up there and getting your 30 seconds with them you know? right right so again if that's your your thing wizards you know they're going to be doing uh outlander as well um um, what was interesting is that I looked to see because uh, Philadelphia's Wizard World is supposed to be, you know, the beginning of June, right. and they still had tickets. You know, they were still showing uh, that you could purchase tickets. So, so they haven't canceled. They the haven't show at canceled this point. anything yet, but you know, since all the other big ones, you know, well, and San that's, Diego. That's the thing. I mean, that's kind of a tight timeline with when. Mm -hmm things are supposed to go back to normal. Right, like you could still do photo ops for various, you know, uh, um, celebrities that were going to be right, attending right. Uh, Wizards. So I don't know, you know, what they're going to, to be doing. So it'll be interesting to, to see, you know, where things, you know, if, you know, do they wait till the last minute to cancel? Because that's what well, I mean, some of the other ones. they're pretty late already in say, the season They're, they're getting point. pretty close. But again, they have all these virtual experiences that you can do. So, yeah. Interesting. It's, yeah. It, it, it's certainly a different aspect to convention mm -hmm. uh, life than being there in person. But the fact that they're sort of extending that out to people in these conditions and and kudos to the stars of these shows who mm -hmm. are making themselves available for it, too. Right. Uh, granted, they're getting paid for it, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, it's it's certainly a way to stay in touch with your fans, and I, yeah. I admire that. Mm -hmm. So, Buffy news. What is this surprising <laughs> Buffy news? So, this was something that, that just came out the other day. Uh, so, it seems that Dolly Parton actually secretly produced Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and the unexpected crossover of cultural icons has left fans reeling. So while you know Dolly Parton was not herself credited as a producer on the long-running fantasy series, the company that she co-created and owned was responsible for it coming to television. So Sand Dollar Entertainment, which is listed at the end of the credits of every episode of the show, was created by Dolly Parton and her friend and former business partner, uh, Sally Gallen in 1986. Uh, they produced a number of films, including Father of the Bride, Fly Away Home, as well as several uh, Parton, uh, Dolly Parton projects, most re recently her Netflix anthology series. Um, it also produced the original Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie, which was released in 1992. Um, and it was actually um, an executive at Sand Dollar, Gail Berman, who still believed that there was potential in Buffy and actually helped to kind of create 
the TV series. To sh- you know, so uh, Berman and Gallen are credited as, credited as executive producers on the Buffy series, along with the spinoffs of Angel. Um, and even though, you know, Dolly Parton didn't have a, a part to play in it, it was never confirmed, but suggests that Buffy San- uh, Summers, whose on-screen birthday was January 19th, is actually a tribute to Dolly Parton, because that's her birthday as well. Wow. Um, so again, it was just kind of, you know, she obviously didn't have a you know, a part to play, but it was her production company. Um, so fans on on Twitter were like, I was today years old when I found out that Dolly Parton was an uncredited executive producer on Buffy the P- Vampire Slayer. And somebody else wrote, what? What? <laughs> and then another added, there is no emoji for the look on my face. Um, so a lot of people were kind of cool, you know, v- excited about it. You know, there was one person that said, you know what? I always liked Dolly Parton and now I like her even more because <laughs> she helped bring Buffy, you know, into my life. So kind of cool. That is kind of cool. I was, I was never, uh, I didn't watch it when it was on TV. I right. always watched it in, in reruns. Right. And mostly thanks to the influence of you and our friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was it was kind of a cool show. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed the show. Yeah. So that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah. I would have never pictured it being yeah, a Dolly never, Parton. Never production. picture uh, her helping it out. Very cool. Well, that was it for our entertainment news mm-hmm. this week. We'll be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your pick. Okay, so my pick this week is a uh, series that is on CBS All Access since we signed up for our free monthly subscription uh, to watch Picard. I decided to do a little uh, searching and and pick something out. Uh, So it is called Tell Me a Story. And there are uh, currently two seasons available. Um, I finished the the first season a couple days ago, and I'm about halfway through season two right now. Um, So basically, it's the classic fairy tales converge in a modern-day New York City uh, with an epic and uh, submersive tale of love, loss, greed, revenge, and murder. Uh, So season one takes place in in New York. Um, And Basically, you have a troubled teen and her dad trying to make a fresh start with the grandmother. So that's the Little Red Riding Hood kind of theme. Um, Then you have estranged siblings, Gabe and Hannah, who are reunited uh, under uh, extreme circumstances. That's kind of the Hansel and Gretel area of it uh and then you have jordan and his girlfriend that can't seem eye to eye on their future and that is kind of the uh three little pigs story so they have these like undertones of classic fairy tales in a modern spin on things um and so the first season is all taking place in in new york city and you kind of get to see how the characters interweave. So even though you have these distinct stories, certain people kind of come into each other's other's lives. Um, now, the second season, which is the one that I'm watching now, uh, takes place in Nashville, and it's the reimagining of Beauty and the Beast, Sleeping Beauty, and Cinderella. So again, different kind of twist um, on it. So even if you know how the, f- the fairy tale ends... That's not what happens. Kind of ironic seeing this isn't a Disney property. Right, exactly. Um, Now, if the season, uh, if the show is uh, renewed for season three, there's already been talk to do Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Jack and the Beanstalk, and Rapunzel as the next uh, story. It's definitely a thriller. Um, It's not meant for kids at all. There is... Uh, adult language, adult situations, violence, uh, the first season. Oh, it sounds like a great family show. <laughs> yeah, not a family show. Uh, th- this season hasn't been as brutal, but there's there's been violence uh, as well. So if you're, you know, it, it's, you know, if you... Um, a lot of the the stars from like Vampire Diaries and and uh, are in are in this, so you get to see uh, you know people that you've seen before, and it's interesting to see them, you know, much more violent and you know 
more villain like right. than you know than you got to see them you know in the past. So I'm I'm enjoying it. So. Very interesting. Cool pick. Thank you. So my pick, uh, as expected, is a kind of an off the wall pick again this week. It is not a book or a TV show or a movie or even a podcast. This week, my pick is a video game. Um, it is one that has been, I think, kind of the savior of our daughter during our quarantine and isolation while, uh, while COVID-19 is going on. My pick is Rock Band 4. Uh, it's available on most game systems. We play it on the Xbox One. Uh, Rock Band 4 is the 2015 music video game developed and published by Harmonix. Rock Band 4 allows players to simulate the playing of music across many different decades and genres using instrument controllers that mimic playing lead and bass control guitar, drums, and vocals. Um, this has proven to be a very effective distraction from the stresses of homeschooling and homework and being stuck in the house and everything else. Uh, it has also proven to be a very effective uh, means of acquiring the necessary family time for all of us to get along without ripping each other's hair out. Mm -hmm. sure. um, we tend to do it a couple times a week. And, uh, you know, we all have our instruments we play. We all have our songs we like. Um, there's there's still songs out there we haven't gotten. We, we acquire new songs on a regular basis. So there is, a, aside from the purchase of the initial kit with the instruments, uh, there is additional purchases of in-game songs that you can buy. Uh, but I think it's that great stress reliever. Uh, we've been using Rock Band since its first rendition. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, couldn't even tell you when it first came out, but yeah. it was probably 14, 15 years ago because we were in the apartment when we first got it. Um, so it's it's been one that's that's been near and dear to us. Um, I started on drums myself. I was promptly kicked off of drums when our daughter decided she wanted to play and she took over the drums and I had to struggle to learn how to play the guitar. Um, and uh, you are our vocal expert. <laughs> Boy, thank you. Um, but yeah, it's it's great fun. It's, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour here and there, depending on how many songs you want to play. Um, it's a good get together and a good distraction. And, and, and the physical exertion of playing drums, I think, has been... Uh, therapeutic for our daughter in, in mm -hmm. working out stress and uh, getting rid of some of that pent up energy from being in the house so much. Right, right. So my pick this week is Rock Band 4 for the Xbox One. And I think that was all we had for the show this week. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go... Uh, I would appeal to all of our loyal listeners out there. If you haven't already done so, feel free to subscribe to us on all of your podcast clearing houses, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, etc., etc. You can reach out to us. We'd love to get your feedback. You can catch us streaming live Six days a week on Twitch at www.twitch slash insights into things. On email, you can send us uh, some notes at comments at insights into things dot com. You can catch us on Twitter at insights underscore things. On YouTube at youtube dot com backslash insights into things. You can catch all of our episodes, uh, audio and video, on the web at www.insights into things dot com. Our audio versions are at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. And we are on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. And that's it for this week. That is it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Take care.